Hello, and welcome to the Cook Memorial Public Library podcast, where we invite you to spend a few minutes with the staff at Cook Library. I'm Nate Goss, and today we are excited to share with you Lindsay's recent interview with author Elizabeth Berg. Elizabeth Berg is a prolific New York Times bestselling author who has published over 20 novels, not to mention numerous works of nonfiction, short stories, and plays. Her novel, Open House, was an Oprah's book club selection, and Durable Goods and Joy School were selected as ALA Best Books of the Year. But beyond her writing, Elizabeth Berg is also known for giving back to the writing community. She is the founder of Writing Matters, a series that gives underappreciated writers new opportunities and teaches many one-day writing workshops. Elizabeth stopped by the library with her dog, Gabby, for one of our Authors Out Loud events to read from her latest work, Make Someone Happy, a collection of her most popular Facebook posts, and to share a sneak peek of her next novel coming out this fall, the story of Arthur True Love. So let's go now and listen to Lindsay's interview with Elizabeth Berg. Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking a few moments to join us on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And Gabby is here with us in the studio, so you might hear her in the background a little bit. Hi, Gabby. That's okay. You're allowed to be quiet. Um, So the name of the tour that you're on right now is called Tales and Tales, um, which is not the title of your recent collection nor your upcoming novel. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about why you're touring under this title? Sure. Um, we lost our uh, older Golden not long ago, mm-hmm. and when um, I knew I was going to do this tour, I wanted to do something to honor him. His name was Homer. Mm-hmm. He was just a, a really wonderful dog whom we rescued when he was a year old, and he was a holy terror, I'll tell you, <laughs> when, we, when we first got him. But he turned out to be the most wonderful dog, and he died at 14 on his birthday. Aww. And it was a real heartbreak for us, obviously. But we decided to try to kind of pay it forward a bit with Homer, and so I asked that every library we go to have three things flowers, Mm -hmm. treats for the patrons, and also um, a link in some way or another with a rescue agency. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, it's just information about how people can get dogs. Sometimes the dogs themselves are there. Mm -hmm. It's been really fun. I (laughs) can imagine. chaotic, yeah. But I just wanted to um, highlight the fact that you can find such a wonderful companion at shelters, and, and so many dogs are in need yes. of good homes. So. Yes. In addition to um, bringing awareness to adoption, um, dogs that you can adopt, you're also here to read from your book of Facebook posts called Make mm-hmm. Someone Happy. Do you see this as a short story collection, mm-hmm. essentially? No, mm-hmm. no. What it, what it is is, is uh, Gabby May Wine. She sees that people are out there. Oh, Um, I see. (laughs) But uh, it's a collection of Facebook posts. Mm -hmm. And so some of them are only a few sentences long. Some Mm -hmm. of them are as long as a couple pages long. I did it because so many people asked me to Mm -hmm. on Facebook. Um, First one person said, you should make a book of your posts, and then another one, and then another. And then I thought, well, why don't I? Right. So that's what this is. And um, they are meant to make you happy. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called Make Someone Happy. Mm -hmm. Uh, That is not to say that these posts shy away from things that are hard in life or poignant in life. There's some of that in there, too. But for the most part, they're just fun. Since this is a collection of your Facebook posts, um, Mm -hmm. do you use that as a um, trial run for writing? Do you write differently if, when you're writing for Facebook? Not really. Mm-hmm. It's it's highly conversational, as, as most of my books are. Right. Um, it's, it's really just a sharing of ordinary life, which mm-hmm. I find not to be ordinary at all. So there are posts about nature, there are posts about animals, there are posts about people I know. There are posts about little kids I pass on the street on the playground or selling lemonade. Or Um, origami. Origami, I read that. That was such a cute story. that was so much fun. Yeah. Um, You know, people say, where do you get your ideas? Well, take a walk. Right. You just get ideas everywhere. Sometimes it's it's just someone I see and, and wonder about, or it's a conversation I have. It's just ordinary life. But I think what the book does is to validate 
the joy of ordinary life. Yeah. I, I saw that also when I read um, the story of Arthur True Love. Absolutely. Yes, a validation yep. of everyday life. Yeah. So you've said in the past that being a nurse and waiting tables uh, long ago was your school for writing because they taught you a lot about human nature, about hope and fear and loss and love and regret and triumph and especially about relationships. Did you already know that you wanted to write when you were working those jobs? I didn't think that I would ever be a writer. Mm -hmm. I always loved to write. Mm -hmm. And I would put all my thoughts and feelings in journals mm -hmm. or letters. I was always writing okay. something. But I didn't think about becoming a writer until uh, my daughters were four and nine. I was working part-time. And I didn't want to leave them. I wanted to stay home with them. So I was trying to think of what I could do to still earn money mm -hmm. and uh, be home. Right. So uh, teachers and friends were always telling me, you should be a writer. So I thought, well, maybe I'll be a writer. It was really <laughs> naive. I didn't have any contacts. I didn't know anything about the business. So I went down to the drugstore. I bought a bunch of magazines I thought I might be able to write for. At that time, magazines were publishing a lot of essays. They okay. don't do as many essays now because the ad count is down. Print industry is suffering like the book business is right. suffering. But right. then it was, it was a great time to get into writing for magazines. I entered an essay contest that I learned about from one of the magazines I bought that day. It was mm -hmm. for Parents Magazine. And I won that contest, and I then began writing for Parents Magazine as well as virtually every woman's magazine on the market, uh, as well as for the New York Times Hers column. And then I became interested in fiction. So I started writing short stories that got published in magazines, and then the stories got longer, and here we are today. Here we are, <laughs> 20 <laughs> novels later. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so as you mentioned, you've been writing professionally for decades now. Um, how has the industry changed for writers? What are you optimistic about? What are you worried about? It's changed a lot. When I first started writing, there were many what were called boutique publishers, mm -hmm. like small publishers that did high-quality literary fiction, mm -hmm. say. And <clears throat> it was a lot easier then for a publisher to take a chance on a new writer. Now, because book sales are down, because people's attention levels are not what they used to be, for whatever reasons there are, mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to get published now than it was then. There are fewer publishers Editors and publishing companies get worried about bottom line issues. I used to say that publishing was an industry run by artists who were trying to do business. Now it's run by business people who are trying to do art. Neither works. Yes. Um, so it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. But what's good is that I think people are returning to reading as a source of solace. Mm -hmm. Of course, for information too, for right. entertainment, but also as a source of solace. And they're they're understanding if they haven't been reading that they miss the feel of their hands on paper, that they like that notion of coming into bed at night and having story to take them somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's starting a little uptick, which is really optimistic. I think we'll jump to the now and talk a little bit about your upcoming novel, mm -hmm. The Story of Arthur True Love, uh, which is set to come out in November. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to describe the book in your own words? Explain sure. to us who Arthur sure. True Love is. Yeah. Um, Arthur True Love was written at a time when actually I had started another novel that was a very dark novel and it was depressing. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, it was about Carson McCullers. It was about her life. And uh -huh. only I'm right. I wanted to write a novel about her as I did about George Sun. But it was really getting to me. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to pull out the very beginning of a novel I started a few years ago, I only had, I don't know, three to five pages. And that novel was begun because I had an image that wouldn't leave me alone of an old guy sitting on a fold-up chair out in a cemetery eating his lunch out mm -hmm. of his paper bag and with his wax paper and talking to his wife, Nola, who was buried there. I just saw him there, and I knew that something was going on in that cemetery. So I pulled those pages back out and started writing the novel. 
It's about a friendship, an unlikely friendship, mm -hmm. among three people, 85-year-old Arthur, 83-year-old Lucille, who's his next-door neighbor, who's a big pain in the neck. Yes. But <laughs> likable anyway. Yes, she and is. And an 18-year-old girl named Maddie, whom Arthur meets in the cemetery. Above all, it's a celebration of the beauty of ordinary life. Arthur is someone who is so filled with love, he practically trips over it when yes. he walks around. He's just unequivocally someone who finds the joy and beauty in almost everything. It was a joy to write. I it can was imagine. So much fun to write. It was a joy to read. I'm it glad. was I tend to read darker things and it was a nice departure for me. I found myself thinking about Arthur and thinking about Maddie or Lucille when I had put mm -hmm. the book down. So yes. Me too. When I finished when <laughs> I finished sure. writing it, I I was bereft and I wanted to be in that little made up town again. So I wrote another book. That yes. Place that yes. I wrote um, a sequel. What was it about this neighborhood that makes you want to revisit it? Are they a are they simpler people simpler time, you mm -hmm. know, a simpler time where and also where people aren't so rushed and in a hurry and have time for one another. I find simple conversation to be really rewarding mm -hmm. when people are honest and open. And I think little towns are charming. So um, it was a cure for me to mm -hmm. write this book. Mm -hmm. And it taught me a lot about the nature of love, what it, what it means to really open your heart. And take that risk to be open about how much you care about other people. My yes. editor said, I need an Arthur in my life. And I said, I do too. I think we all do. <laughs> yeah. You must give a lot of advice teaching your writing workshops and your writing matters workshops. Um, what's one of the most helpful or insightful things a fellow writer has taught you? Um... You know, that's a difficult question for mm -hmm. me because I kind of go my own way. I've always felt that my my voice, as it were, uh, is something that's very easy and um, joyful for mm -hmm. me to bring out. So I didn't really need tips on how to write. It mm -hmm. was so natural and easy for me. But if I could turn the question around a yeah. little and say, what do I... What do I tell people who take my workshops? What's the most valuable thing I can tell someone? Two things. One is never be imitative or derivative. Your own original voice is what people are going to be interested in. Right. We need new voices. We need new books. We need a kind of authenticity that comes from people being themselves mm -hmm. on the page. Whatever is the essence of your voice needs to come through. And the other thing is to remember when you are writing to separate the editing and marketing side from the creative side. Mm -hmm. So many people get hung up trying to edit at the same time that they're writing. You have to keep it separate. Those are two very different brain mm -hmm. processes. Yes. And, and it, you're very vulnerable when you're putting yourself on the page again, even if you're writing fiction, and maybe even especially if you're writing fiction, because that's where the emotional truths right, come out. Right, right. Um, but remember that you never have to show it to anyone. Write what you really feel you want to write. You can always edit it later. Do that later down the road. But when you are in the in initial heat of writing, get it all out. Don't hold back anything. And don't worry about who's going to read it, who's going to buy it, all that stuff. That's right. the marketing. Get it out. Edit it into being the thing you want it to be. Then worry about selling it. I can't tell you how many people tell me, how do I get an agent? And I say, do you have a book? And they say, no, I have an idea. <laughs> That's not going to get you anywhere. Right. Unless you're some gigantic New York Times bestseller with a lot of <laughs> books under your belt and then you say, I have an idea about a coffee shop. They go, okay, here's a contract. Right. It's not going to happen with a first book. You need to do the best work you can and then send it out mm -hmm. to an agent when you're done. Very practical <laughs> advice for not just writing, lots of artistic endeavors, yeah. I think. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap up with when we do these um, podcasts with our staff, we're usually talking about what um, staff have been reading lately. There are mm -hmm. any recommendations. So do you have anything that you've been reading lately? I read a lot of books at a time, but I'll just tell you about one. 
because we don't have seven hours. <laughs> um, but there is a book called My Struggle by Carl Uwe Nosgaard, translated from the Norwegian. It's six volumes mm -hmm. of an autobiography. And I don't know how this guy does what he does. He will tell you about getting a cup of coffee and adding sugar and cream, and you're fascinated. Oh, yeah? I don't know how he does it. It's it's just his life, but he's remarkably honest mm -hmm. about every aspect of his life. It's a little voyeuristic. Right. It's, it's a, a little literary. It can be funny. It can be poignant. And he, he does these big, fat books, and I'm on volume six. I've and, seen and them on our shelves. Yes. I'm just like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm telling you, go get volume one and start reading it. I, mm -hmm. I had heard about it. it. It was apparently a big sensation mm -hmm. in Norway. And, in fact, here, he's, he's come here, and he's also very good looking. Oh, you know, I saw his picture on the back oh of the book. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Woo! Um, but... Uh, I, w I had heard about him, and I was in San Francisco, actually, on book tour, and I was in a bookstore with my, with my best friend, Phyllis, mm -hmm. and I found his my struggle, and I said, you know, I've heard about this, and we both started reading it, and Phyllis said, I'm going to buy this, and I said, I'm going to buy this, too, and then we're totally hooked. It's definitely on my on my to read list, but I think yeah. it's going to get bumped up quite yeah. a bit now. Yeah, so. just read a couple pages yeah. and see what you think. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for being on the podcast thank with us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Elizabeth Berg. And if you'd like to see what books we have by her, you can visit our website at cooklib.org and search our catalog. You can also use the catalog to put yourself on the waiting list for the upcoming novel, The Story of Arthur True Love. If you would like more information about the Animal Education and Rescue Group of Libertyville, who joined Elizabeth Berg for her Authors Out Loud program, you can visit their website at aear.org. If you're on our website putting holds on Berg titles, take the time to stop by and visit our library's blog, Shelf Life, where we share what's new and interesting in books, movies, and music. If you want to get in touch and leave some feedback, send us a message anytime. Send it to webmaster at cooklib.org. And if you're enjoying this podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you could spread the word and leave us a kind rating on Apple Podcasts. We will be back soon, but until then, keep reading, keep watching, and keep listening.